right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for our spring IEP training. Um, please feel free to drop any questions you might have in the chat box. We will have some chat box check-ins, but we can also try to answer them as they pop up. Um, we will have a stretch break built into the presentation. Um, we're scheduled to go, I believe, until 1130. So somewhere around halfway, we'll do a little stretch break. Um, and you are here this morning for our spring IEP training for NUF and its impact on IEP development and faith. And we're so happy to have you guys here. Um, our agenda today, we will start with some brief introductions from our team. Then we will go over IEP sections one through four. Then Jennifer will talk about Andrew F and data analysis. And then we'll go over sections five through eight of the IEP. And we have some other considerations, um, some frequently asked questions, and then we have some really great resources for you at the end. So we will do some introductions for our team. So Colette Sullivan is our fearless team leader and the federal programs coordinator. She can't be with us here today. Um, I am Ashley Satry. I am one of the members of the team. I've been here for about 10 months now. I had to do the math this morning to figure it out. I knew it was coming up on a year, but it's about 10 months. Um, and before I joined the DOE, I was a special ed teacher in Maine and in Virginia for about 14 years. Um, and with us today is Jennifer Gleason. Good morning, I am Jennifer Gleason. And before I joined this amazing team three years ago, I too was a special education teacher and an ed tech as well. And Carly. Hi everyone, I'm Carly Thibodeau and I joined the team, it must be a year and 10 months because I'm just a year beyond Ashley. So good thing she keeps track of that extra time. <laughs> um, and before that, I was a teacher. I have taught special education, general education, and I've been an interventionist. And Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I've been with the DOE for, um, I'm in my seventh year. Prior to that, I was admin support at a K-5 elementary school for 16 years. And we would be lost without Julie, literally. We don't even know where we are in the state sometimes without <laughs> Julie telling us. So <laughs> we're so glad she's here. <laughs> um, all right. So before we get started, if you guys um, have anything on your mind that you'd like to um, get clarification about for uh, regarding IEPs, or if you have any specific questions that you're hoping that we might answer during this training, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, if they come up during the training, that'll be great. And if not, we can circle back and answer those during one of our chat breaks or at the end. Um, so just anything you might be hoping to get out of this presentation um, around the IEP. And while you're doing that, um, one of the things we um, like to start off with is kind of what we see in the field as we're um, out and about looking at IEPs, um, there are some issues that come up over and over again. Um, so during previous on-site visits, more than 50% of the IEPs that we viewed, uh, reviewed did not meet compliance because of the following things. So um, we'll go into these in depth, but um, starting with gaps being identified that there were no corresponding goals for, that's that alignment piece, you guys are gonna hear us say alignment more than you've ever heard it in your life probably this morning, um, but it's really important and it's, um, so we talk about it a lot. Um, and then there were how statements missing in, I won't get into the details of that yet, but in section four, we need to have a how statement and those were often missing. Um, goals were not measurable because they included references to specific curriculum and standards or standards. Um, goals are also not measurable because they included multiple skills, and so they couldn't be clearly reported on during that progress monitoring. Um, present levels, um, present levels had a lot of subjective language, like child struggles with, or the child sometimes, um, or they didn't have any baseline data at all. So we'll go into present levels. 
Um, and then some more alignment things, bowls did not align with a service or services did not align with the bowl. So we will talk about all of this in depth um, as we go through the PowerPoint. Um, this document right here, if you're not familiar with it, I recommend it so highly to download it, print it, add it to your desktop. Um, when I started this job, it's called the IEP Quick Reference Document. Um, it was the first document that really helped me kind of organize what we're looking at. And so I find it super helpful. I just kept thinking how helpful it would have been as a teacher if I had known that this existed because it really shows what we're looking for in the IEP and in each section and the user citation for why we're looking for it. Um, the findings on the left side are not important. That's just an internal code that we use. You'll hear about them during the review process if you're in it, um, but that part's not important. Important. It's just the location on the IEP and the criteria for what we're looking for. So I do like to give the caveat that it's a little overwhelming when you first look at it. It's, I think, 14 pages or so. Um, so stick with it. And once you realize kind of how it's organized and what it's for, I find it super helpful. So it's linked here. It's linked in the chat that, uh, or in the PowerPoint that Carly shared. Um, and it's also on the website and we update it yearly. So if you're not in cohort, um, just check it out because we update, make small changes yearly. So um, that is my plug for the IEP quick reference guide. All right. And so we like to start with what is the purpose of an IEP? So IDEA says that the purpose of an IEP is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a free and appropriate public education or FAPE that emphasizes special education and related services designed to meet their unique needs and prepare them for further education, employment, and independent living and to promote that movement back to general education, because as we know, our students with IEPs are general education students as well. All right, so now we're gonna jump right into the actual meat of the IEP. So section one, that's your SAU information, the date sent to the parent and the child information. And you'll see that the date the IEP is sent to the parent is circled there. That's one of the things that we look for for compliance to make sure that that is sent within that 21 school days of the IEP meeting. Um, that's taken right out of Muser. So there's your little Muser snip that says that the copy of, to the parents must be sent within 21 school days of the meeting. Um, and so just make sure that that's filled in on that section one. Um, some IEP programs auto populate that, I believe, and some don't. So just make sure that that's filled in. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, okay, so then the other section of section or the other part of section one is the dates. So the, as everybody knows, the date of the annual review must not exceed that 364 days from the last annual IEP meeting. So um, the annual date being January 6th here, and then the next annual meeting needing to be January 5th of the following year, there's that 364 days. Um, and there's your Muser SNP that just says that, that, that it needs to be reviewed at least annually. Um, and then we have this visual for the timeline and this started to just really click in and make sense to me the other day when I was starting to think of this as two timelines. So two, and this may be confusing to you guys and I'll have my team jump in if I confuse it by explaining it the way I think about it. Um, but looking at this as two timelines. So if you have your annual meeting date, you have 364 days for that next annual meeting date. That's your first timeline. So January 6th to January 5th of the following year. Now you have your our guidance that we give of giving three days for the parents to receive that written notice in their hands. Um, and then you have your seven days for the parents to consider the IEP, which would be about 10 days from the meeting for the duration of the IEP to begin. So this starts your second, in my brain anyway, 364 days, meaning that the duration would be January 16th, 2022 through January 15th, 2023. So just looking at those as two separate 364 day timelines. Um, and then there's the box from the IEP. And as I was thinking about this this morning, I thought for my brain, it would make so much more sense if it was the annual date 
and then the date of the next annual and then the duration underneath, but that might just be my own thinking. Um, so that's what that box should look like. Um, and of course, um, that for a consideration for the timeline, parents can waive their right to that seven day notice. So the IEP could be implemented sooner than that seven days. Um, the seven day waiver form is optional, but it must be documented in the written notice that the parents waived their right to the seven day notice. So we give this, this um, example of just saying the child's parents waived their right to the seven day notice prior to the IEP implementation and agreed to make the IEP IEP effective starting the next day. So um, again, they can waive that notice, um, just make sure it's documented in the written notice. And a question for you guys to ponder, uh, when can a parent or guardian not waive their seven day notice? And if you have any ideas about that or you're feeling brave, you are welcome to put that into the chat box. Initial consent, okay. And give it a little more thinking time. We've got to, I've got to be better about a little bit of wait time. <laughs> All right. So parents can only not waive their seven day notice if they do not attend the meeting. So um, Michelle, I do think that that was the previous thought that it was initial consent, but upon reviewing um, user and the documentation, Parents can waive their seven day notice for the initial consent, but they cannot only if they don't attend the meeting. All right, so moving into section two. So the disability section, um, a child with a disability is an individual who has reached the age of three years, has neither graduated from a secondary school program with a regular high school diploma, nor reached the age of 22 years, has been observed in the learning environment or the classroom setting, and has been evaluated according to the rules and have been determined to have a disability which requires the provision of special ed and support services. And a child with a disability shall have one or more of the disabilities listed in user. And as you know, the the a ending age changed to 22, I think it was October 25th, yep, of 2023 um, from LD98. So um, the disability categories here, um, if you look in MUSER, um, there is a definition and a procedure for determination for each of the disability categories. Um, so if you ever feel like you want to just get out MUSER and look that up, it's searchable if you find it on our website um, and you can look up the disability categories and it tells you the procedure for the determination and the definition for each. Um, and we have a, an awesome office hours presentation from 2022 that focuses on the entire eligibility process and the related forms. It's Ashley, I just put a brand new one up on the website. We should have updated this um, yesterday. Oh, so there is a new one up there. So if you go to our professional learning page, Office Hour Archives, there's one that says eligibility. Apologies. Nice. For that. Um, will this link take them to that one, Jennifer? Or do we know? Probably not. No, it will not. Okay. It might be. I'm not sure what happens with this link, but um, go to the Office Hour Archives on the professional learning and you get the brand new one. Nice. I'll grab it and put it in the chat. Thanks, Harley. Um, we'll have several more links to our um, webpage, but there's a ton of great resources on there. So if you're either a new teacher or you're just looking for a little bit of refresher, there's a lot of awesome information on there. So um, we'll get that all straightened out. Okay, so this is our first visual that we like to give around that alignment. So alignment, alignment, alignment. I would print this out if I were starting to teach now. Um, so you start with your current evaluations and your progress results. That, what, that is what drives the rest of this train. Um, those evaluation and progress results will give you the academic, functional, and developmental strengths for your student, which we'll go into more detail. It will also give you the distinctly measurable and persistent gap in both academic and functional and the how statement for um, how that affects their progress in the gen end curriculum. But when you're looking at the alignment piece here, you want to look at those orange boxes specifically 
because each of those gaps should then be aligned to a present level, which should then be aligned to an annual goal, and those should be aligned to services. So the services don't need to be one-to-one -one because we could have multiple um, you know, reading goals or math goals or whatever, um, but that's where that alignment comes. And then all of that together provides that least restrictive environment and start the whole cycle again with your annual update to get those current evaluations. So um, just a little visual we like to give about alignment and we will go into each of those sections more in more detail. Okay, and then we have section three of the IEP. This is your considerations. And you can think of this as your table of contents. Um, one of the important things here is around that alignment again. So if any section here is documented yes, we would expect that there's corresponding information in the IEP itself. So if let's say H, for example, the student has, uh, does the student have academic need? If that's checked yes, you're gonna wanna make sure that the A evaluations uh, reflect that need and that there is academic support in the IEP in the form of goals, services, et cetera. So this is kind of, it's the table of contents, but it, it can also be used as a check for, uh, does your student have academic needs? Do they have functional needs? If those are checked, yes. Do they have services? That'll help you check for that alignment. So that is section three. And then we move into section four. So here is where the, the IEP, we start to talk about those academic, functional and developmental evaluations, the strengths and the needs. And we're gonna break this down into each section. So there's four A through E starting with section 4A. So section 4A is the results of all evaluations. So in section 4A, you're gonna have your academic evaluations that were used for eligibility or continuing eligibility, your functional evaluations that were used for the same, any relevant state or district assessments, uh, transition assessments for students who are of transition age, um, and any other relevant assessments, such as an FBA or related service evaluation or anything else that is um, that applies to this student. If you have an evaluation, you're going to want it in 4A. Um, and we give this example of, uh, looks like a psych eval completed by Jane Doe on 10, 15, and 10, 15, 22, 10, 17, 22. They administered the BASC on 10, 12, 22. You have your scores there. Um, and the Woodcock Johnson with the dates and the scores. So you're gonna wanna make sure you're documenting the evaluation name here, the date the eval was given, and any scores that highlight the strengths or the needs in the student profile, and also maintaining any scores that support eligibility. So make sure you start thinking about your alignment here or are thinking about your alignment here. For a student with academic goals, we would expect to see academic evaluations. Um, for a student with uh, PT services, we would expect to see PT evaluations here, et cetera. So um, that is section 4A. Then we have section 4B. So One section while we switch interpreters. Okay. You're all set. Thanks, guys. Um, okay, section 4B is the academic, functional, and developmental strength of the child. So for our example here for section B, we have that Leora loves to read and has strong decoding and comprehension skills. She has strong writing skills and enjoys sharing her stories with peers. And Leora works hard and is very focused on all tasks presented to her. So um, one of the key phrases here is this is beyond the evaluative information. You probably can't see that because it's so small in print, but if you're familiar with the IEP form. Um, so don't restate those evaluations here. This is where you wanna talk about what that looks like in the classroom. What does your student like to do? What are they good at doing? What, is, what are they relatively good at doing? Um, so again, I, uh, yeah, I guess I covered all those bullets without reading them. So <laughs> based on the evaluations and observations, include areas of strength and relative strength. Don't restate those standard scores. And what does the strength look like in the classroom? Oh, and that should not be blank. I didn't see if that was on there, sorry, but 4B should not be blank. Um, okay, so we're gonna start looking at the academic uh, side of things now. So 
when we're looking at academics, we're thinking about reading, writing, listening, speaking, and mathematical problem solving. Those are those areas we would consider in academics. And section 4C is your distinctly measurable and persistent gaps in academic performance as well as the how statement. So thinking about those areas of academics, this is a two-part box. Part, sorry, Jennifer, we go back one more set, one more time, thanks. Um, so part one, this is where you're gonna wanna identify the distinctly measurable and persistent gaps in academic performance. So that should be in 4C. Also in 4C, you need that how statement. So how do those distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps affect the child's involvement and progress in the gen ed curriculum? So just remember that 4C is those two things. We're looking for both of them, the gap and the how statement. Thanks. Um, so again, when you're considering academics, you're thinking about those broad areas of reading, writing, listening, speaking, and math problem solving. And there could be some other areas, but, um, but what we are looking for is we really want those specific areas of those broad academics that the student is struggling with. So if a student has a decoding or a fluency error that you're correcting with an IEP goal, instead of giving us a gap that they have a, a gap in reading, tell us that it's decoding or fluency. What is that specific area that they're targeting? So just really drill down into what the specific skill deficit is that the student needs help with. Um, and then some examples of what that could look like. The next slide would be, um, here's just adding those two things together. So you've got your gap for Jimmy. Jimmy has a reading fluency deficit. So we would expect to see that reading fluency deficit. And the house statement for that could be that Jimmy's reading fluency deficit impacts his ability to access grade level reading material. And another example for math might be that Tom has a deficit in addition and subtraction. And how does this impact him in the gen ed curriculum? It impacts his ability to participate in grade appropriate math activities. So you can um, put those how statements if you have a student who has multiple gaps uh, in fluency, spelling, and we'll say retelling stories, you can bullet those gaps and you can just give us one how statement of how those gaps impact their ability to access that gen ed curriculum. It doesn't have to be one how statement per gap. It can be if that makes more sense to you, um, but we would just expect to see the gaps and the how statement. Um, and the procedural manual goes into more depth on page 22 of what 4C looks like and what we would be looking for there. Um, the procedural manual is another one of those um, resources that's really helpful if you have time to look through it. Um, it really breaks down all of the forms and what we're looking for in there. And it's linked at the end. So that was academics. Um, on the other side of the coin, we're going to look at functional. So when we're looking at functional gaps, we're looking at our functional performance. We're looking at cognitive, communicative, motor, adaptive, social, emotional, and sensory. And this will sound familiar, but it is because it's the same as 4C, it's just 4D for functional. So again, in 4D, we need those two parts. So here's where we're gonna wanna see the distinctly measurable and persistent gaps for functional performance. Again, we recommend kind of listing that out as bulleted, um, a bulleted list just for alignment. Um, and then we also need to see how do those distinctly, me distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps affect the child's involvement and progress in the gen ed curriculum. So this is another two-parter. So the gap and the how statement. And here's some more examples for functional. So again, if you have a student who is showing some issues in the, let's say, adaptive area, um, instead of saying that they have adaptive gaps or adaptive functioning gaps, what are those gaps specifically? So do they have um, issues with toileting? Is it hand washing, cooking, bathing, et cetera? Um, and the same for sensory. So is it processing? Is it self-regulation? Is it attention to task? 
um, really drill down into what that specific skill gap is and give that to us in that bulleted list. And then we would expect to see the corresponding goal. Um, here's some more examples of what that could look like with your how statement. So <clears throat> Michael has a specific deficit with grasping items. That would be a motor deficit, but it's in his grasp. And that impacts his ability to use writing tools in the classroom. Or um, let's see, we'll go with Sarah. Sarah has deficits with answering WH questions. And this impacts her ability to engage in conversation with peers during play activities. So just remember, we need to see both of those pieces. And the procedural manual talks about section 4D on page 22 and 23. Um, and again, we we'll link that at the end. And I am starting to sound like a broken record, but it's the same thing for section 4E. This is that developmental, the same needs and how statement. Just remember, you have to have the distinctly and measurable gaps and the how statement. So having both of those pieces. Um, we often get asked this question about functional versus developmental and which is it? And we would say, I think that this is an IEP team decision for our purposes. It doesn't need to be one or the other. We do give the guidance that functional is kind of that lifelong skill deficit that the child's not going to outgrow developmental being something that the IEP team thinks the student may outgrow. Um, again, that's an IEP team decision on which one you put that under, but just make sure that that alignment is there. So um, that if it's a functional goal, it would be, or a functional gap, it would be a functional goal, et cetera. So um, a little wrap up from that. Um, Remember, what are those specific areas? Just avoid those broad areas of math, reading, writing, et cetera. Um, don't include or reference any evaluation results in that section or standard scores. So just be super specific with those skill deficits and gaps. Um, all right, so we've got a little example here. So um, in section 4C, we've got our student Eli, who has a distinctly and measurable gap in fluent letter identification. So you can see that it's been bulleted. Um, fluent letter ID is the gap. And the how statement is that skill gaps in this area impact Eli's ability to participate in literacy activities with same age peers. And on the functional side in 4D, you've got um, a gap for reading and following a schedule. So this deficit impacts his ability to attend school and participate in all daily activities across his day. So you've got your gaps and your how statement in each section. And just remember for the last time, I think, make sure you have both of those components, your gaps and your um, how statement. So now we're gonna take a little quiz. All right, so we're looking at section 4A for this question. Um, and again, that's those um, results of evaluations. So if you're feeling brave and you wanna tell us why this wouldn't be compliant in the chat box, um, and we'll, I'll give it a minute. And in case you can't read that, I think the font's a little bit bigger, but there you go, exactly right. We need a date there, yes. Any other thoughts? Okay, there's our answers right there. So no dates and no scores to support the strength. So those are, what are all gaps there, um, but make sure you're including the scores to support your strengths. All right, so this is an example of what it could look like. Um, this is, would be considered in a compliant example. You've got your evaluations administered. You've got the name of the test. You've got the dates of the test. And you have those scores to include the strengths and the gaps. All right, we're going to do one other question, one more question, uh, or a couple more questions, I guess. Section 4B. So tell us in the chat box why this 4B wouldn't be compliant. And remembering that 4B is the strength of the student.
All right. It's okay. Yes, there needs to be something in 4B. So there should be some strengths listed here. It shouldn't be blank. It shouldn't be NA. Yep, exactly. So no strengths documented. Um, here's that example again of what it should look like. Um, just make sure this is a great time to be a lot of times in your IEPs. We're talking about the student's skill gaps, and this is a great time to be robust in their um, strengths and just put as much as you can there about how well they're doing. Um, so I won't read that example again, but make sure it's not blank or NA. All right, one more question. All right, we're looking at 4C now. So in section 4C, if you had a list like this, tell us why that would not be compliant for section 4C of academic performance. Yes, that's exactly right. Too broad. That reading and math is too broad. We want to know what specifically they're struggling with. And there's one more thing that's missing in 4C. There you go. That's right. You got it. No how statement. That's exactly right. So broad areas, not specific enough, and no how statement. <clears throat> nice. Here's a nice, uh, another example. Here's a good one with two gaps, two and one how statement. So this student has um, skill gaps in spelling and addition and subtraction, and the how statement being that these skill gaps in these areas impact Susie's ability to participate in academic activities with same age peers. All right, one more question for 4D. So this one's a little bit smaller. I'm gonna read this one to you, but it's section 4D, and it says that Julia has executive functioning deficits and cannot maintain attention to tasks. What would be wrong with this section 4D? I think my chat box froze. Oh, there it goes, it's catching up. Uh, yes, so that is too broad. And what, yes, what is the executive functioning deficit? So executive functioning, much too broad, no specific skill deficit listed, and again, that no how statement. Hmm, sorry, my, I don't know what happened with my chat box there. I think we're caught up. Um, okay, so here's what that should look like instead. That specific skill deficit that she has is in self-initiation, and this impacts her ability to maintain attention and complete assigned tasks. Assigned tasks. All right, and then as I've been talking about that alignment um, and academic and functional skill gaps and how statements, we have some great uh, recorded PD. These links should work for you in the um, PowerPoint and um, it'll take you to our professional development around alignment if you'd like to hear more about that and the skill gaps and how statements. And I think with that last chat box check-in, if you guys have any questions about those first sections, um, go ahead and drop them in the chat or you can come off mute if you want to. And then we're going to turn it over to Jennifer, I think. Not seeing any questions. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on, and if you think of questions that involve those sections, that's okay. Pop them in there. All right. This is just a little reminder that your progress reporting on the students' IEP goals um, need to be done at least as often as report cards for all students. So let's move on to Andrew F. If you've been in any of our other trainings, you've probably heard me drone on about Andrew F. Um, but this was an important case. Um, so Andrew F. Um, is a student. He was going to public school. And his IEP looked the same from year to year to year. Um, he wasn't making any progress. So when he was going into fifth grade, his parents rejected the IEP and enrolled him in a private school. 
that specialized in working with students with autism. I think I forgot to say Andrew had, has autism. Um, so in that private school, he started making progress. So the parents filed due process to get reimbursed for that tuition. And at that time, the um, precedent was the Rowley case. And what Rowley said was any progress is progress, merely more than de minimis, that's okay. So using that precedent, the hearing officer found in favor of the school district because any progress counts. Um, so the parents appealed to the district court and to the circuit court, and they all agreed with the hearing officer because of Rowley. They, um, you know, any merely more than de minimis, A-OK. -okay. The parents appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, you know, that's not really good enough. All students have the right to make progress, right? They have the right to work on um, challenging objectives, challenging goals. Um, and the school must offer an IEP that is reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress in light of their circumstances. So when you're writing your goals, they need to be reasonably calculated to enable that child to make progress. So um, we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but I know I was a functional life skills teacher. I was working on skills for way over a year with my students, and I knew that that was going to be several years to get this skill. So I had to calculate those goals so that they can be achievable in a year. So if the student is, you know, 10% independent with hand washing, maybe I write my goal to get them 30% independent with hand washing, because I know it's going to take several years. I'm not going to write the goal to 80% from 10% knowing my students. So as you're writing your goals, they need to be calculated to enable the child to make progress. And this is a really nice document the U.S. Um, Department of Education put out, this Q&A. It's not very long, and it's really written in plain language and really easy to understand about the Andrew F. Um, case and its implications to special education. And it seems like we're going to switch gears here, but it's really related. So um, think about your data, right? Everything needs to be driven by data. Um, so if you are collecting data and you're not looking at it until it's time for progress reports to come out, you're not using that data, right? If you, I looked at my data every single day and you don't have to do that. I know that makes a lot of people sweaty in their pits to think about. Um, but I mean, you should look at your data fairly often so that you know if what you're doing is working, right? If if the student isn't getting it, it's not their fault, right? Maybe we're not teaching in a way that they can understand it and we have to change up what we're doing. And the data will tell you that and it will tell you that sooner rather than later, right? You don't want to wait until, you know, it's the annual meeting to say, oh, this doesn't seem to be working. You want to know. Think about Andrew F's case. I don't know what happened in Andrew F's school, but I imagine if the team was looking at data often and using it to change up what they were doing to make sure that Andrew F was getting it, then maybe they wouldn't have gotten into the pickle they got into. Um, so a couple things to think about as far as progress, right? You wanna make sure that the child is receiving all of their services in the IEP. You wanna make sure that all the accommodations and modifications are provided everywhere the student goes or everywhere it says that they're going to get those in section six. And you wanna make sure that the goals are really measurable and clear and your um, progress monitoring is really clear um, to show that progress. And this is just what we said earlier. If 
if the team maintained and analyzed their data and used that to drive their programming and change up when they needed to change up, they probably wouldn't have, um, he wouldn't have had the same IEP year after year. All right, so with that in mind, we are gonna move on to section five. So we're gonna talk about present level of performance and goals. So present level of performance, I don't even like to say those words anymore because it's not what we look for. It's your baseline data, right? You have one for each goal. It's your baseline data for that skill gap that that goal is addressing. So this kind of helps me think about it in a good way. So your baseline data, your measurement data for your goal and your progress monitoring, those are, that's your data. That's your same data point need to be in all three places. This is part of that alignment that Ashley kept talking about. Also present level is a must fill. So if you have a student who has um, functional gaps, but no academic gaps, that statement, the statement right here, um, needs to be in that very first present level. Some kind of statement stating that the there are no academic gaps or they're on par with peers, something. And the procedural manual talks about this on page 24. Same thing for functional. If the student has academic gaps but no functional gaps, that statement has to go in that first functional um, present level. And that's on page 26. So more about present level. So it's your baseline data. You wanna make sure it's really clear. You don't wanna put anything subjective in there. It's not approximate. It's a really clear data point, right? 62.3%, you don't have to be that close, but um, less than 60%, that kind of thing. Is it one or is it 59? It's not really clear. So put a really clear data point in there. Um, if you um, have a new student and you haven't worked with them before and you have time to just do a quick probe and get one data point, that's your baseline. At this moment, this is where they are with this goal. Because if you don't have your baseline data, how are you going to make that goal? How are you going to reasonably calculate that goal that such that the student can achieve that goal in, in one year? Really think about that. You really need that baseline data. You're not going to use grades, grade level, standard scores, percentiles, or reading levels in your present level. Right? You want really clear baseline data for that specific skill gap. And you're going to use this data point for your progress monitoring, which you're gonna do often, and these things don't lend themselves to that. Um, and also they're more for the broad areas. Um, you're not gonna put multiple skills or prerequisite skills in there. We're gonna talk about pre prerequisite skills, I think in a few minutes, um, but one, one skill gap gets one goal. One skill gap gets one present level gets one goal. Oh, and look, and here's a picture. Um, one skill gap, one present level, one goal. It aligns both ways. So here is an example. Molly can decode CVC words with 45% accuracy. And we want Molly to decode CVC words with 85% accuracy. So you can see that really clear alignment. It's the same data point. You have your baseline data and you've used that data to calculate the goal measurement where you wanna be in a year. All right, Any I know I go fast, so I'm gonna just kind of slow down here for a minute and ask if there are any present level questions. Give you a minute to digest. All right, I'm gonna keep going. Try to slow down, but I'm not good at that. Um, I'm working on it. All right, so you're all very familiar with this. This is what your IEP needs, to, your goal needs to look like, right? By this date, given this service, um, the child will 
do this thing with this level of mastery? Yes, really good question, Michelle. The present level can be at 0%. Absolutely. I had a lot of those, um, definitely. That is a valid data point. All right, so standards. Carly, jump in if I say something wrong. Um, so as you know, you need to align your goals to standards, but the, you're not going to make the standard the goal, right? The standards tend to encompass more than one skill and the goals really need to address the student's skill gaps, right? They are individualized to the student's needs. So the goal is going to address the, um, the student's skill gap, and then you're gonna link it to a standard. You're gonna make sure that there is a standard, right? So you wanna assume competence, begin with the grade the child is in and kind of move down to, um, where the team feels they can go in a year. We have this um, example of how to um, cite domain learning results. It's not as easy to cite them as it is Common Core. Um, this is just one example. You can do it however makes sense for you or how your director wants you to do it. Um, this just lays out that it's main learning results. This is the strand, which in this case is writing, the grade span, which in this case is adolescent or high school, and the standard number. So you can do it this way or you can do it another way. This is just an example because we were getting a lot of questions about how to do it. All right, so we talked about don't use, don't reference specific curriculums and your present level or goals. And we're going to give you a little example of that. So we have our pretend reading curriculum, right? And we have Leo. So Leo is at level A and we want Leo to get to level B. I can guarantee you none of us know what level, e, level A and level B mean. So should there be a grade attached to the standard we are linking? It depends on the standard. Yes, because there, there are, sorry, I'm gonna go back. So there's a grade span for um, main learning results. I think Common Core has, I don't think it has a span. I think it has each grade, is that right? Yes, yeah. I believe the Common Core is broken down by grade where the main learning results is that span. So that span. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you do wanna put that in there. Another good question. All right, let's go back to Leo. Sorry, I got distracted. I shouldn't have the chat box up because I do get distracted. Um, so Leo is going to go from level A to level B. I don't know what that means. If this student changes school districts and they use a different reading curriculum, the new teacher won't know what that means. The parents might not know what that means. Um, so let's look at what that means. So level A means that the child will learn 19 consonant sounds, the first 25 high frequency words, and be able to segment CBC words. Level B, oh, you can't see that last one because it's in the, it's in the blue. Um, level B Segmenting is vowel sounds. Segmenting CCVC words. Thank you. Vowel sounds, high frequency with the next clunk, the next 15 high frequency sight words and segmenting CCVC words. Here we go, we have it here. All right, so if we just put Leo's gonna go from A to B, right? What if he only masters a couple of these? What if he only masters vowel sounds and segmenting and he's not reading the sight words? Did he master the goal? Did he not? Is he at level B? Is he still at level A? Where is he, right? You wanna break this down to those specific skill gaps, right? It's based on the child's needs, right? So, and you want each gap is 
a specific skill deficit. So here you would maybe have a goal. Leo will segment CBC words and Leo will identify 19 basic consonant sounds. So this is, we're working on level A here, right? So we're breaking those. We're, we're, we can take the skills, we can use that curriculum to teach, we can use it to assess, but in the IEP goals, we are grabbing those specific skills out of the curriculum so that they're understandable and he can switch to another school district and the um, new teacher will know what he's working on. All right, I'm gonna move into functional. Do we have any more academic questions? I'm much more comfortable in the functional area. I was say there's nothing popping up in chat right now. Thank you, Carly. All right, so same format for academic and functional. Um, same kind of measuring things. We can use skill-specific measurements or assessments, like pulling that, pulling those data points out of that reading program. Um, qualitative data through teacher observation, checklists, running records, daily logs, work samples, um, rubrics, just if you're gonna use a rubric, kind of just pay attention to it. Um, some of them are really subjective, have multiple skills, and make sure you attach it to the IEP. Um, again, please do not measure your goals using eligibility evaluations, state and local assessments, grades, report cards, or specific um, curriculums. You want that really specific um, data measurement. All right, we got another quiz. Here we go. Present level, Jennifer demonstrates the ability to rhyme less than 70% of the time. Why do you say begin the first thing? So Diane has a question. We might say beginning first grade level for comprehension to beginning second grade. So you want, how are you measuring that comprehension though? You can say something like, um, student will um, identify the main idea and three details with a second grade reading passage or something like that. Like you, you can reference the second grade reading passage, but your comprehension, how are you measuring the comprehension? Is it WH questions? Is it identifying main idea? That kind of thing, right? Yes, answer WH questions and then you reference using a second grade text. All right, what do we got here? Jennifer demonstrates ability to rhyme less than 70% of the time. Oh, Diane put it in there. Less than, must be specific. Very nice. Perfect, yes. Oh, wait a minute. First grade passage will answer five. I'm assuming that first part must be the... Is the present level. So if they're only at 60% with the first grade passage, are you moving them on to the second grade passage? I don't know. That's an IEP team decision, but... Um, Just to clarify that, the first part was the present level. At the present level, the student is at a first grade, uh, can read a first grade passage and answer five questions with 60%. And then the goal would be given a second grade passage, they will answer the quest five questions with 60% accuracy. So we're not using a curriculum, we're using a reading yeah. tool. I, I think that's okay. Okay. That's good. Thank you. All right, so Jennifer demonstrates the ability to rhyme simple one-syllable patterns with 42% accuracy. Very clear. 
All right, Mary can decode CVC words with 55 to 70% accuracy. And we want Mary to improve her reading comprehension using a third grade text from a standard score of 72 to 80 as measured by data collection, Woodcock Johnson and work samples. This one has a lot going on, makes my head hurt a little bit. So what's happening here? Could first grade present level be prerequisite for second grade goal? I have to think about that one, Andra. There's a range in the present level. Yep, that's one thing. Right, you're not going to administer the Woodcock-Johnson. That's why we don't use standard scores to measure goals. <laughs> what else we got here? There's a big glaring one here. Yes, it's the alignment, right? The present level, the baseline data is for decoding and then the goal is for comprehension. So that's not baseline data, right? And then there's the one that we always forget, we all miss it. There's no citations in the standard. So um, the data point is range. It doesn't align. And the goal references standard scores. And there's a citation missing. But you guys got the real, you know, the big ones there. We all missed the citation, um, although it is important. So here we go, decoding with 62% accuracy. And we want her to decode with 80% accuracy. So I'm coming back to Audra's thing here. So if we had a goal here that said Mary can decode CVC words, and then the if the present level was Mary can decode CVC words with 62% accuracy, and then the goal was we want Mary to decode CCVC words, I would say that they don't align because they're not the same skill. And now I'm going back to Diane's first grade to second grade and Audra's question about that, that if the student reads, if the present level is the student reads a first grade passage and can answer five questions with 60%, how many questions can the student answer correctly on a second grade passage now, that would be your baseline data. Am I saying this right, Carly? Does this make sense? Yes, but I would almost um, be the devil's advocate and say yeah. it's still the same skill. It's about comprehension. You're just upping the... But if you're upping it, like... Right. Your baseline data, I mean, it would where they I are guess, with second grade, because how do you know they're able to get to 60% with the second grade passage right. when when they're only at 60% with the first grade passage? I don't Can know. Can I ask I, a question? Please. Make sure you're muted. right now. Can you hear me now? Yes. So when we talk about goals in the present level being aligned, like mm -hmm. for this specific, specific goal, when I look at it and I hear what you're saying, Jen, about it not being aligned, but then I think about kids making progress, right? And so we might have a kid that we know is going to make a lot of progress. So mm -hmm. if I say, okay, I know they can do CVC words right now at 62%, but by the end of the year, I want them to do, you know, C, V, C, C, or C, V, C, V words. Yeah. Because I know I can get them there with 50% accuracy. So wouldn't that just be those building blocks? Like I, I remember back in the day or a long time ago, they used to say, you know, a present level, like for multiplication, 
might be that, okay, they don't know anything about multiplication, but they can add three digit numbers or, or um, three numbers because that's repeated right. addition, right? So right. it's like those foundational building blocks to get there. Yes. And, and I, <laughs> yes. And it's, I think it's important to put that in there, but also the fact that they can't do multiplication at all. That's your baseline. And I'm probably going into the weeds because that's the kind of data person I am. Um, so I'm going to go back to IEP team decision on that. <laughs> All right. And with that, let's take a break. Five minutes and we'll be back here. All right, our five minutes is up. Is everybody back? Let's see. Looks like people are back. I think I was a little late. All right. Any more present level discussion or questions? I think this is really good discussion to have. Um, It's helpful for us to have this, these talks. All right, I am going to move on to outcome-based goals. So these are things that we see mostly in functional goals. And with I was teaching all of my functional goals were outcomes. Um, it's a hard thing to wrap your head around. Um, so outcomes are those age-appropriate expectations. So it's easier to think about in academics, but we typically see them in functional, they're harder with functional. So if we talk about this at, from the academic level, right? We want all kids to read on grade level, right? Do math, be able to write on grade level. Um, but what are you teaching them? You're not teaching to read on grade level. That's the outcome. So your goals are around skill deficits that are getting in the way from the student achieving that outcome or age appropriate expectation. So we're teaching around those skill deficits and hoping to get to that outcome of reading on grade level, right? So if Bill is in seventh grade and reading at a first grade level, Right? There is no teacher in the world that would write a goal that said, Bill is going to read on the seventh grade level. Right, That's, You're just not going to do that because there are, you know there are many discrete skills involved in reading and you're going to figure out where those deficits are and you're going to teach those. So if Bill has, he has weak decoding skills, Right. So here's his his present levels. Right. You you want his. Um, well, this is see, this is what we're talking about. So he can decode with CVC with 100 percent, CVCE with 23 percent. So your goal is going to be to bring CVCE up to 75 percent. So this I would put both of these things in the present level, both the CVC and the CVCE. So it has the prerequisite and the baseline for that thing. Um, but what you're teaching is decoding. You're not teaching reading at grade level. You're teaching decoding. That will get Bill closer to the outcome of reading at grade level. So this is an example of what that can look like. There's his gap in decoding. You have the um, present level and the goal. So we want Bill to read at grade level. What skill are we gonna teach? We're gonna teach decoding. All right, let's look at some, well, no, this is still an academic example. Okay, so Eli is in first grade. He has, a gap in letter ID, right? So that's what we're going to teach. We're going to teach letter ID. 
do we want Eli to read at the first grade level? 100% we do. But first we have to get through letter ID. So that's what we're gonna teach. So we want Eli to read on the first grade level. We're gonna start with letter identification. That is that skill gap. Another visual, so the bottom is the outcome and there's all of those skills plus a lot more, as you know, that go into getting there. Um, so for me, uh, the real thing, the thing that helped me understand outcomes is answering the question, what are you teaching? Um, if you're not sure, definitely get the team together, um, talk about it, take data, figure out what those skill gaps are that are getting in the way of that outcome. So here are some that we see a lot. Um, attendance, work completion, reduce instances of behaviors. That was my go-to. Um, safety, attention to task. These are all age appropriate outcomes, right? These are things, yes, this is where we wanna get to, but what are we teaching right now? What are those skill gaps that are getting in the way of these things? So. Nina is in first grade. She demonstrates aggressive behavior. So you wouldn't write a goal that says, Nina will decrease aggressive behaviors. You're not teaching that. I will tell you almost all of my IEPs had this exact goal, um, but I wasn't teaching that, right? I was typically teaching communication skills because behavior is communication. Um, so that's what my goal should be around those communication skills. Um, so Nina cannot use a visual to request help. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to teach her to use a help card to request help rather than scratch our eyes out when she needs help. So we're going to teach her to request help. That's going to increase her ability to request help, which should reduce those behaviors that she is using to request help. So this is what it would look like in the IEP. Um, and you can see that we're still referencing aggressions, right? So she has a skill deficit in her ability to request help in situations that are challenging for her. And then our how statement is, this impacts her ability to engage socially with peers in ways that are not aggressive. So that outcome is the how, right? That's, that's how this skill gap is affecting Nina's ability to participate in the gen ed curriculum. So you can see you have like the steps, um, the task analysis, she'll pick up the help card, reach and release to a communicative partner. Um, so this is another one where the prerequisite is here. So when prompted by an adult, she can do it. She can pick up the help card, reach and release in 100% of opportunities. Independently, she doesn't do it at all. She can do it in zero opportunities. And we want her to do this independently in 70% of opportunities. So that's another situation where we have those two different skills in the, not two different skills, but really very much related skills in the present level. So we want the number of regressions to be reduced. We're going to teach Nina to request help. So your goal is around what are you teaching? Another example, um, Jane is in third grade and she has a deficit in her ability to self-initiate. And this impacts her ability to maintain attention and complete assignments. So there's your outcome is in the how statement and the skill gap is self-initiation. Um, she starts work tasks within 12 minutes in 100% of opportunities and we want her to start within five minutes in 80% of opportunities. So we want her to complete her work. We're gonna teach her self-initiation skills. 
think we have one more. Oh, attendance. Um, you're never teaching attendance, right? You're, I know attendance is a big problem now, um, but what are those skill gaps that are getting in the way of attendance? In this case, um, reading and following a sk schedule impacts Lewis's ability to attend school and participate in daily activities. So we're gonna um, teach him a first then board, right? He can use it with 18% accuracy. Now we wanna get up to 50% accuracy. So we wanna increase attendance. We're teaching a first then board. Um, for older kids, it will be some, you'll probably have the social worker. It will be social work goals, I'm guessing, but you never know. Um, so really think about your teaching the skill. What are you teaching that's getting in the way of the student getting to that age appropriate expectation? Procedural manual talks about this on page 26. And I know this is a really, really hard thing to wrap your head around. So any questions? Nothing has come into chat, but it that doesn't mean it won't. So okay, that's okay. <clears throat> Works for me. All right. So let's see what's wrong with this one. Margaret is demonstrating reading skills at the fourth grade level, and we want her to read at the fifth grade level. So what do we got there? way too broad. This was kind of a gimme, right? <laughs> so um, reading at the fifth grade level is that, right? Read at grade level, that's what we want. But everything is too broad. It's not measurable because it's not a specific skill deficit. So instead, what is it? What, which reading skill are we looking at here? In this case, it's fluency. Um, She's at 37%, which is a weird way to measure fluency, but anyway, 37% with a third grade passage, and we want her to get to 80% with a third grade passage. All right. Jeffrey demonstrates aggressive behavior over 64% of his day, and we want to get that down to 15% of his day. So how are we doing that? Why is he aggressive? That is the question, right? What skill is getting in that way, in the way, right? So let's see. It's an outcome. We want all kids to be free of aggression. It's not a skill, right? Reducing aggression is not a skill. What are you teaching? Why, right? You might end up, you might have to do a, get an FBA done to figure this out. Um, so, it's typically communication, right? So um, when presented with situations that require Jeffrey to take a break before becoming aggressive, he can exchange the break card with 19% accuracy. So he's he's got a start on it and we want him to get to 50% of the time he's requesting a break, right? And you're... Um, you can see that that's referenced in the goal as well. It's not just in the how statement and you can do it however makes sense or you don't even have to um, talk can about the a, Sorry to interrupt. Can I ask a dumb question? No. no. A clarifying <laughs> question? There are no dumb questions. Go ahead. <laughs> I think sometimes in IEP meetings, I see us get hung up when like you're exactly right. A lot of times aggression or these these physical behaviors are due to a lack of ability to communicate, right? Yes, right. So then then the team gets into a, well, is that a communication goal then and not a, not, not a, does that need to be worked on through speech and not SDI or is that not, not my area? I guess I'm just looking for some guidance on kind of how to talk about that in meetings. 
That is a really good question. And my, my undergrad degree is in speech and language. So I came across this a lot because I was very focused on communication for my kids. And often um, my speech path and I would come up with the same goals. <laughs> so what we did was given SDI and speech and language therapy, student will, blah, 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 blah. So you can work on the goals together if you would like. I mean, you have to work together very well to do that, but um, that is an option. Um, if you have um, a BCBA or some kind of behavior specialist available who can do the FBA, um, you might wanna do SDI and BCBA consult or something like that. Um, because you're really working on that um, replacement behavior of communication. Is that helpful or not at all? Y yes. <laughs> okay. You could say it's not. It's okay. <laughs> Gen Jennifer, can I add something to this? Yes. Hi, uh, Lena Vitagliano. I, um, I think you're absolutely right. So, so be aggression or behavior often is a result of inability to communicate communicate wants, needs, right? And yeah. we're not all going to be speech and language pathologists or have a, um, a specialty in that area, but we can all support students in figuring out how how to communicate their needs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a goal, but it could be an accommodation. But I also, I just want to add this. I think a lot of times students' behavior, whether it be aggressive or not, or a lack of communication is a result of them being given work that is too difficult for them. Right. Yep. So when students are faced with work that is not doable, their be the best option is to behave poorly to avoid it. Right. So it's like yep. it's not always about communication. It's, it's about making sure that they're being given work and that the IEP goals and the collaboration with general education is there so that you're, you know, so I just, just want to throw that out there. Yep. And that's Thanks. a good and that's I would argue, Lena, that that is also communication because there's self-advocacy involved, right? This is too hard. Can you help me? Something, you know, something along those lines. True. So. Now, on that same topic, self-advocacy would be the skill deficit, correct? Yes. Okay. Just want to double check. Good. <laughs> all good. All right. I do love these conversations. It makes it all... I think it cements it all for us. Um, this is just kind of an aside. If you are teaching these things, right? If you are teaching a visual schedule or if you're using whatever visuals to, if you're teaching a help card, right? Um, and I will point out that even students who are verbal um, sometimes can't be if they're dysregulated. So even if the student is able to verbally say, I need a break, they might still need a break card or something um, to help them ask for it because when they're in that state, they might not be able to verbalize it. So just something else to think about there. But um, if you're using any of these supports, if you're teaching the student these supports, make sure that you put them in section six so that everybody knows they need to be available and then they would once the goal is mastered and they're using that support, that would stay in section six, but there wouldn't be a goal anymore because they're already using it. Um, related services, when we go through this, um, we get the question a lot, like, do I need a separate goal for every sound I'm teaching the kid for articulation? And no, you don't. You can, articulation is the skill. Um, and the outcome is communication. So don't panic, you don't need a separate goal for every sound. All right, we have these recordings for present level and avoiding outcomes. Um, so those are handy and those links should work because those are to the modules. All right, questions before we turn it over to Carly and move on to section six. All right, all yours, Carly, and thank you all for that 
conversation. I do enjoy that. Yes, that was good to get other people's perspective on things. It's always nice. Okay, moving on to section six. Here we have those supplementary aid services, modifications, and or supports. And uh, in the procedural manual, you can find more information about this on pages 27 and 28. Always a good resource to go to if you have questions. And then this is just a snapshot of what section six could look like. Um, you can see that anything that starts in the left-hand column is filled out completely across the row. That is one thing that we look for when we are monitoring for this section is that there are no blank boxes. So just make sure to, that you're checking off where you're using or when you're using them, like classroom instruction, classroom assessment, those places that you're using them along with the location, the frequency and that duration date. Um, you can also see here in the second row, there's an ILAP, which is an individual language acquisition plan. So that would be for any student that's a multilingual learner that may have an ILAP. This is where you would wanna document that in section six, that they're also receiving that service as well. And then um, just a little information about section six. We really think about this, or I do, I think about this is where you put those accommodations and or modifications. And just to note that an accommodation changes how the student learns versus a modification changing changes what the student is taught or expected to learn. And then there's just a link for more information about that. And we have a couple of examples. So a modification in that change, um, to the curriculum and or assessment would lower the standards of the curriculum in some way. So an example that is given is that um, the student, a modification is that they can use a calculator to complete an assessment um, versus other students that may not be able to use that calculator as a modification. And then an accommodation would be where they're changing the manner in which they're getting the instruction and or participating in the assessment, but the assessment and the materials are the same. It's the same level of expectation. So an example of that would be versus reading a book to themselves, they could be listening to a book. <clears throat> All right, more uh, information about section six. Um, if you are um, talking about a something that's happening with the students, such as uh, a collaboration between staff members, you can document that in section six um, and there would be no goal attached, okay? So this is when it is not, when there's a service happening or there's some kind of collaboration happening that isn't directly related to an annual goal, then you would want to document that in section six and just we, in the procedural manual, it talks about calling it a collaboration so it doesn't get confused with consultation. Um, and this is just an example would be like, if you're like, well, I just wanna check in on the student and see how they're doing, but I don't, I'm not working on a goal with them. And so this is more of that discussion of progress that would happen between the two adults. This would be a good place to put that. And then also, this is where you would put any um, ed techs, BHPs, related service assistants that are working with the student. They would not go on the service grid as a position responsible or provider responsible. Um, they would go in section six. And again, just making sure that all of those fields are considered and complete all the way across the road. The other part of section six is that alternate assessment piece. And so when you get down here to 6B, you need to check off one of those boxes, yes, no, or NA. This cannot be blank. So if you check yes, there needs to be an explanation there of why the student must participate in the alternate assessment. Um, and then there also needs to be objectives with the academic goals in section five but this must be filled out, yes, no, or NA. And this is just a link and to the participation um, 
decision flowchart for the alternate assessment. And this is a snapshot of what that looks like, um, but this link will take you there if your IEP team is deciding whether the student will participate in the alternate. And then I kind of already talked about this. So if the student does qualify as taking the alternate assessment, those academic goals must have objectives. And so this is a link to the alternate academic achievement standards. There we go. They're also known as the core content connectors. So they actually have two names, which is pretty confusing to me, but they're listed on the website. If you go to this link and you're looking for them as the core content connectors and ELA and math, and then those ones in science, the extended performance expectations. So if you are looking for those to um, guide or to link to your goals, if a student is taking the alternate, this is where you can find them. And then this is just an example of how you may um, document those on the IEP. So you can see you have the goal around, this is Lily, she'll be participating in conversations and express her own thoughts in eight out of 10 opportunities. So that's her goal from for the year of the IEP, for the um, duration of the IEP. However, her objectives are broken down so that by February, she'll be able to do that skill in six out of 10 opportunities. And then by May, she'll be able to do that same skill in seven out of 10 opportunities. So this is really just kind of building blocks um, up to meet that goal within the year. And then these are just some resources for you if you have questions about filling out section six on the IEP. There, um, there's a link around those accommodations and modifications. There's also a link to the main through your assessment overview um, where you would find those, there's an accessibility guide so that you can uh, see what accommodations are available to which students. And then there's also the multilingual learner with disabilities document or guidance document that we have. And there's a link to that recording as well. These are all things that could be and should be documented in section six, as well as the MSAA, that alternate assessment overview, if you have questions about alternate assessment pieces. All right, moving on to section seven. This is that service grid. Um, and really just keep in mind that when you're documenting services on the service grid, you want to keep in keep the child's needs at the forefront. Um, their needs really drive their services and not the school or program schedule. Um, we see this a bit more at like the middle school, high school level with block scheduling. And so we just kind of want to talk about what we mean by this. So if we have a school that has their block periods for an hour, let's say, so from nine to 10. So this student would be in a study hall from nine to 10. Um, they're receiving everyone else is in study hall, they're in study hall, but they're getting reading comprehension during that time. So they go into the special ed study hall, but they are only getting 30 minutes per week. So they would only be out of that block scheduling, I don't know if it's 30 minutes, or like 10, 20 minutes per block schedule, however that works, right? So they still have quite a bit of time where they could be back in with their peers. So the idea is that the um, service grid would document the needs. So they only need to come out 30 minutes per week for that reading comprehension, even though there's more time in the schedule. So they should have that option to return to the general ed setting. Um, if the student chooses to stay in the special ed setting, that would be okay. But make sure to document that in section six as an accommodation so that they have that option to stay if they choose. But if, it's, if their time is up and they're done working on their specially designed instruction and they're like, no, I wanna go back to my gen ed study hall, then that should be an option available to them. They shouldn't be restricted to that special ed setting. All right, and then when filling in section seven, you want to make sure that you fill in, again, if you start with something in the left-hand column, you wanna make sure you fill out across the row the position responsible is a must fill. These are those certified special ed teachers or licensed related service providers. That's why you don't wanna put ed techs or um, those BHPs or those related service um, assistants here. That's where they go in section six. These are those certified individuals. 
then you also have to fill in that location. Typically it's special ed, gen ed, or both if it's a combination. Um, and then you have the frequency that can be however that looks for all of you. Um, just making sure that everyone that participates in the IEP team, including the parent understands that frequency um, and then the duration. And just make sure to adjust those ESY dates so that they're reflective of just ESY because if you have it for the duration, that means that they then could get services during February break or during winter break, um, spring break, however that works. So you just wanna make sure it's during that ESY time of summer. Um, and then speech and language. So if a child is a child with speech or language impairment, that's their disability category, either by itself or as part of a multiple, then you want to list speech and language services in the top part for the special ed services. If it's anything else, you put it under related services. Um, oh, I did leave out that unless they're identified with autism and speech and language service is their only service, that would also go at the top. Um, other than that, it would go unrelated. Okay, and then also on the service grid, just keep this in mind that when you are writing your services in there and you have your specially designed instruction for those students ages five to 20 or five to 22 rather, um, each identified instructional area should be listed unless the child is in a self-contained program. So they have a couple of examples here and this is right from the procedural manual on page 32 and I think I have another example of it coming up. On the next slide, there it is. So it might look something like this. So if you have a student that has um, some ELA goals under academic, but then they also have some functional goals for behavior, you can just put them together because as we often say, they're not typically pulled out for a certain amount of time to work on those behavior goals. It's really throughout the entire day. So you're typically embedding it everywhere they're receiving that SDI. So you can just put it together. Um, and then just making sure that if you have a consult, making sure that that is clear and it should be aligned to a goal. And I think we'll talk more about that in a minute too. Because every service needs a goal and every goal needs a service. That's that alignment piece. So you can see here, it needs to go both ways. So we have Elaine here, she has a goal around given specially designed instruction and consult from an occupational therapist. So as Jennifer had mentioned, if you can work together on a goal, you can, you can put both of your services in that one goal and you can both work on that. Um, so here, there's specially designed instruction and consult from an occupational therapist and they're both working on her being able to use that individualized toolkit. So in the service grid, because they're both listed in the given statement, we would definitely wanna see that there's a specially designed instruction around those self-regulation skills relating to this goal and also a service for consultation in occupational therapy. So, and it would go both ways. If we saw occupational therapy consult on the service grid, we, we would be like, oh, is there a goal for consult? And we would look back to the goal. So we look at it from, from both ways. And here's just another kind of way to think about the consultation um, that would go on the service grid versus something that you would document in section six as an accommodation. So that consultation is really, is when you're thinking about um, taking a skill that the student has kind of mastered in that uh, special ed setting and with direct instruction. And now you want to see if they can do it in that less restrictive setting. And so um, maybe it's a consult goal, but you still have that goal that you're working on and it would still be skill specific. Um, and you would still be monitoring that and keeping track of that progress and see if they're making, if they're mastering that skill that's in the goal. Where again, if it's just, you wanna keep an eye on them, see how they're doing, that sort of thing, and you're not having, and you're like, I don't want to work on a goal with the student. We don't need to work on anything. I just want to check in, check in with the teacher. Then that's where you would want to put it on the accommodation page in section six. All right, another note about 
the service grid, social studies, science, health, et cetera, all of those other areas besides the reading, writing, math um, should not be on the service grid. There would be no goals written around science, social studies or health or any of those other um, content areas because there's no disability in those areas. Really the disability would be in those areas of reading, writing, math, that sort of thing. And so your goals would be written around um, those skill deficits from those deficit areas. And then your services would be related to those goals. So you wouldn't have any goals around science, social studies or those content areas. So there shouldn't be services for those areas. Okay, any questions about sections six and seven? I think I saw some things happening in chat, but I think Jennifer answered, I'm assuming. That's right, Carly. <laughs> okay. Jennifer answered them, yeah. All right, excellent. So, all right, so we'll move on to section eight. And this is about the least restrictive environment. So you can see here, this is a snippet from the IEP, and it says in the K to 12 section, an explanation of the extent, if any, to which the child will not participate with non-disabled children in the regular class and in extracurricular and other non-academic activities. So that is a very interesting prompt because it is not what we look for when we look at compliance, because IDEA and user tell us to look for something else. So it's really about, see those bold and underlined words there? It's really about the nature or severity of the disability and in that child's disability being of such that they cannot be in regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services and um, be with their gen ed peers basically. So it's really due to the nature or severity of the disability, which it doesn't say in that prompt on the IEP at all. And that's exactly, this is exactly what we look for. So um, to just kind of go into that, we'll uh, look and see what's next here. Just to give you an idea about least restrictive environment. Um, this is just a little visual. You start reg gen ed or regular ed is that least restrictive environment. And then obviously it's gonna be different for every student but it goes up to the most restrictive of that hospital homebound. So we wanna find that least restrictive for the student, for each student. And when you're thinking about that as an IEP team, you really think about all the components of the IEP. You put it all together and be like, okay, this student has this disability identification. They have these academic and functional skill gaps and needs. You know, they need to work on these goals, so they need these services. And that really all ties together and, and tells the team what the least restrictive environment should be for that student. So when you're thinking about filling in that prompt on the least restrictive environment, and you're thinking about that little percentage off to the side, it's really about the student's access to the general ed instruction. So even if they're in the classroom, you wanna be thinking about, are they receiving the same access to the general ed curriculum as their peers? Because if they're in the gen ed class, but they're working on something completely different at the back of the classroom, then that really is not part of that LRE percentage. Um, however, if they are in the gen ed classroom and they're working on the same curriculum or maybe even a subset of skills or like just something a little off, but it's still part of that gen ed curriculum that everyone else is working on, then that really is part of that LRE percentage. So you really just want to think about, are they receiving that same access to the gen ed curriculum? And then when you think about that statement of least restrictive environment, this is really what we're looking for. You can see here it says Sammy's other health impairment due to ADHD is to such a degree that he requires individual and small group instruction in the special ed environment. So just saying that his disability is to such a degree or that the students, anyone's, is such that they require that 
specially designed instruction or small group instruction, whether it's in the special ed environment or the gen ed environment. So just distinguishing where they're receiving those services and why around that nature and severity of the disability. Okay, I do see there's, okay, so Jennifer's answering the question in chat. No, that's okay, I, it's all good. Uh, all right, so we'll jump into the quiz. Have a little quiz here. We're gonna talk about section seven and section eight. So here we have a little snippet of section seven, the service grid where we've got reading comprehension and science, and then you can see the things filled out across the row. So what is wrong with this? Why would we mark those, right? Not science, that's, yes, you got it. So we're not providing SDI in science, as I talked about. Um, it's really around that reading comprehension, most likely, um, if that's what the, it's been identified. And then also there's a duration date it should have been 11.2 to 11.1. So that one's always, I, I'm terrible with dates, so I would miss that too. So here's what it should look like. We would just take that science off. It's about that reading comprehension piece and change those duration dates. There's another one from section seven. So you can see we've got SDI for reading fluency. We've got the pieces filled out. We've got some ESY. We have speech and language services. What do you notice here? All right, we've got some blank boxes because it should be filled out across the entire row and the res person responsible. Yep. Exactly, shouldn't be an ed tech. And then I think there's a date, yeah. Is there a date problem somewhere? I think so, maybe. Yes. Oh, ESY, yes. It's for the whole IEP, not just those ESY dates, exactly. Yep, very good, you guys caught them all. So instead it might look something like this. We have that location filled in. We have the special ed teacher being responsible and we have those ESY dates adjusted. All right, one more, and this is about that LRE statement. So here, oh, Jennifer gave it away. Hopefully no one was paying attention. No. So the statement says Lisa attends all specials as well as lunch and recess with her peers but receives specially designed instruction 18 hours a week and speech and language therapy two hours per week. So what is wrong with that least restrictive environment statement? Right, it needs to be about the nature and severity. This is, this is all well and good, but we've already talked about that in the service grid. So we don't need to restate that here. <clears throat> so instead, you could say Lisa's autism disability and accompanying deficits in academics, ex executive function, and social skills are such that she requires specially designed instruction in the special ed setting to access her programming. And that would be plenty. That's a, that's a mouthful, actually, right there. Okay. And here is another link to our uh, module about IEP section six, seven, and eight that may go into some more depth if you have any questions about that or just want to look at that, those sections instead of the whole IEP. Okay, any other questions about anything? Because this is the end of the IEP. So I got I got the easy part. I got the closing. This is this is great. Jennifer's answering all the questions in the chat box, so it's perfect. <laughs> okay, so here are just some other considerations as you work on your IEPs and do any other paperwork. Oh, here's that procedural manual. This is the table of contents, very helpful. The links on the left will take you to our recordings on each of the topics. So we've got a recording around the written notice, eligibility forms, summary of performance, B13 transition plans, and B11 child fines. So 
those are all available on our professional learning page. Oh, and then of course, abbreviated day, everyone's favorite topic. <laughs> so an abbreviated day is any time that a student is not attending school, any time a special ed student is not attending school the same as their gen ed peers. So there are certain requirements needed for documentation for abbreviated day. And this link will take you to our recording around abbreviated day and go over those requirements for documentation. All right, any other questions? I don't think so. Okay, so at the beginning we had asked folks to put in chat anything that you needed clarification around or questions answered from today's IEP training. Um, was there anything, I, I didn't see anything put into chat at the beginning, but has anything come up for you that we did not address that you would like more information on or clarification around? I know there was some great discussion during the goals and present levels, and that seems to be the meat, right? Like that's the big, that's always the meat of the IEP. Okay, I think everyone's good. More resources for you. If special transportation is a service, do you need a goal? If it is related to behavior or something that you can improve, if it's a goal where you're just, move, you're, the student is being transported from one school to another, because let's say they're at a different placement, then no, you would not need a goal. However, if it is something that the student can improve on um, and why they need that special transportation. And the only thing that I can really think of is behavior because they've, they're not able to ride the regular bus or, you know, um, and they need the special transportation. But if it's medical or anything like that, you do not need a goal. I, I think of it as if it's a temporary thing, you need a goal. Yeah, that's a good word to use. I like it. You know, if 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 they're always going to need the special transportation, then no, you don't need a goal. But if it's if it's like they were kicked off the Gen Ed bus and we're going we're trying to get them back, then you need a goal. Yeah. Good clarification. Temporary. Okay. So here's some more. Okay, and then we have our procedural manual. I think I've we've uh reference that quite a few times. So, you know, it'd be good for you to have <laughs> if you don't already. And then we have Muser, which we do reference, but Muser is a difficult document to deal with sometimes. So we tend to send people to the procedural manual more. And then we also have, oh, here's our IEP quick reference document, a link to that. Again, we uh, shared that at the beginning of the training, but this is another link to that. And then we have all of these lovely resources. These pretty much come from our website. So we have our professional development calendar, which we're kind of winding down this year, 23, 24, but we'll have a whole new schedule for 24, 25. So, you know, keep an eye out for us. And then we have the links to the recordings and the PowerPoints that we have previously done. And then we have those resources and more links to laws and regulations and forms and reporting, so. Lots of good stuff for you. Um, these are our professional development topics that we did in 23-24. These are the ones that have already been completed at the beginning or the first part of the year. The blue links do take you to the recordings. These are the upcoming ones. Uh, there are only, what, one, two, three, four left. And we're doing B13 this afternoon. If you would care to join us, if you do anything with transition plans, that would be a good thing for you to attend. Um, those blank ones are just ones that we have already done, but the recordings aren't up on our website yet. So as we get them up, we do try to update this, but they're just not quite ready. But they will be eventually. Um, and then these are just some ones that we would love for you to share. Most of them are already happened. Um, the discipline and manifestation determination is on our website. This link will take you to that recording. The other ones, like I said, we're still waiting to just get those up and live on the website. 
uh, the they're there. I put, I put them all up there yesterday. So oh sorry. Gosh, you should have, you should have warned me. I, I know I said I would. And I... <laughs> okay. And then Jennifer is going to be, um, hosting, what do I say? Presenting the consultation related service goals on 5824. So share that with your related service providers. We would love to have them attend and participate in that conversation because that's going to be a good one. Oh, and then this is our link to our feedback form. I'm going to try to, if I can find where I am, I'm going to grab that and put it in the chat for all of you if you're still here. And this, we just, we love feedback. We try to improve our PD based off of your feedback as much as we can. Um, and if you put your email in, um, just make sure you type it correctly. And today is an IEP training. It should be right at the top of the list when you select the trainings and you will get a contact hour for attending today. And then this is just the main Department of Education. We have some uh, social media links. Looks like YouTube, Twitter, I guess it's X now, Instagram, Facebook, you know, all the good things. And then of course the website. And then our contact information. Please get in touch with us. If you have any questions, we always say, Ashley usually does this little spiel, but I'll take it away from her. Um, if you have questions about IEPs and you want to send us hypotheticals and you, if you want feedback when writing goals or any parts of the IEP, it really doesn't matter, but it just has to be hypothetical. Don't send us an IEP um, because then we're, because we are the monitoring team, we are supposed to, we are mandated to ask you for um, corrective evidence if we see things. So just, you know, hypothetically, if I were to write a goal around this, is this good? And we are happy to give you feedback. And you can send that out to other people writing IEPs if they want to do the same, share our contact, and we will give feedback. And we appreciate all of you joining us today. Thank you so much. This is a this is a lot of information. It's a long training. It's a lot to take in, but we do have the recording. Um, so Julie will get that ready and we will get it sent out as soon as it is ready or up on our website, I should say. <laughs> so if uh, any of you are coming to B13 this afternoon, we'll see you then. Amy and Meryl, thank you for joining us today.